Well, good morning, and uh, I'm really pleased to see all of you here, and I'm very pleased to talk to you about the, uh, the, some of the next chapters uh, in our State of the Bay report for San Francisco Bay for 2011. So as your program says, I'm going to be talking to you about the indicators that we developed for fish and flow, and I'm actually going to correct myself right off the bat here and say that, in fact, I'm going to talk about flow first and fish second. Before I do that, though, what I'd like to do is, uh, since we really haven't talked about the whole bay um, in, its, in its large and complex and uh, geographic context, I wanted to set the stage a little bit. As all of us are aware, this is uh, a really unique and unusual estuary. It's uh, an in inland estuary, and it has a lot of geographic complexity to it. For some of the work that we've done here, with our indicators, we're actually recognizing four different regions within San Francisco Bay, so I want to introduce you, probably unnecessarily, to those just as a, as a sort of preparation for what I'm going to be talking about. We're also aware that estuaries, of course, are the interface between freshwater rivers reaching out into the ocean, and so, in fact, the freshwater flows that come into an estuary are really a key, critical, physical and ecological driver. In this particular estuary, 90% of the freshwater flow on average, comes from the Sacramento-San Joaquin watershed and enters the bay in its upstream end, um, first going through the delta, and then, of course, after it, all the rivers have their confluence into the upstream region of San Francisco, San Francisco Bay, Sassoon Bay. Because of the fact that most of the water is coming in at this one geographic location, within the estuary itself, there's really very interesting and large environmental, ecological, and ecosystem gradients generally associated with salinity. Very near the upstream, near the confluence, and up into the delta, it's generally pretty fresh water. Um, and as you move downstream in the bay towards the Golden Gate, you reach the point where you're pretty much talking about marine waters, particularly when you get to um, uh, the Golden Gate there. So you have this wide range, uh, driven largely by salinity, of ecosystems, and that has consequences for the living resources, and in particular the fish that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to talk first about the work that we did developing indicators for the quality and quantity, the amounts, timing, and patterns of freshwater flow coming into San Francisco Bay. These uh, measurements are based entirely on flows from the Sacramento-San Joaquin watershed, which, as I mentioned, uh, provides 90% of the flow. Um, and in fact, the data that we used are from some wonderful data sets de uh, developed by the Department of Water Resources over many years. And we used actually two different data sets. We used Dayflow, um, which is a, um, essentially a, a, a simulation model and a mass balance model measuring flows in the delta. But one of the key elements that it measures is delta outflow. We use that as our measurement for the amount of fresh water flowing into San Francisco Bay. And we also used another data set produced by the Department of Water Resources, where they've gone back, both historically and, and also they update this fairly regularly, uh, looking at what they refer to as unimpaired stream flows. These are the flows that would have happened on rivers. This data set includes river flows. But they also include a component for unimpaired delta outflow. These are the flows that would have occurred, that would have flowed into San Francisco Bay if there had been no dams or water diversions in the system. It's not necessarily the same thing as going back to historical conditions, because in fact, these unimpaired flows are based upon the current landscape and topography of the system. But they are the flows that would have occurred um, if there were no dams and diversions. We know that this is a, this is a really important uh, element and sort of component of what we understand about this system, because in fact, we have altered the flows on virtually all of the bay's tributary rivers. Um, and what the bay sees in actuality now is not necessarily what it would have seen if there were no dams and diversions. This graph is showing for water year 2010, which is the most recent year for which we're calculating the index. Water year 2011 isn't done yet, uh, so keep in mind we're only going up to water year 2010. And this graph is showing the amount of flow expressed as delta outflow that flowed into the bay in actual conditions, shown as the red line, compared to what would have flowed into the bay uh, under unimpaired conditions, the blue line. And it's just for a single water year, which in California goes from the beginning of October to the end of September. As you can see, because of our water management operations, the dams that we've built on these rivers and the amounts of water that we divert from those rivers, either at the dam, downstream, or from the delta, we've really substantially altered both the amounts and patterns and timing of flows into the system 
And in most particular, we've altered it in the spring. Um, and of course, that's the way we manage the system. Our dams are designed to be catching the flows uh, from spring snowmelt. And uh, we manage that water for a variety of uses. But the largest impacts are occurring during the spring. All of the indicators, and there are six different indicators in the freshwater flow index, are measuring the difference between actual flows and unimpaired flows. And for example, they're measuring um, as a total um, uh, amount of fresh water that flows into the bay in a single year. They're measuring what percentage of that unimpaired flow actually did flow into San Francisco Bay. We'll see another indicator that looks at peak flows, and it's measuring how many days flows were high, greater than 50,000 cubic feet per second into the bay. And it's comparing the number of days that actually occurred with those flows to the number of days that were predicted based on unimpaired flows. So essentially, the freshwater flow indicators and the index that is calculated from it by mathematically combining the results is really looking at flow alteration in this system. It's not only looking at on an annual basis, it's also looking at it over a multi-year basis in terms of uh, variability from one year to the next, dry years versus wet years, and variability within a year, the large flow periods versus the low flow periods. So let me show you just some examples of those indicators. I can't show you them all. Um, there are too many of them. But this one is the indicator that we developed to measure um, the alteration in annual flows, the total amount of fresh water that flows into San Francisco Bay expressed as a percentage of the unimpaired. Each of these two graphs, the y-axis is showing you the percent of unimpaired, and it's plotted against time, in this case, for a data record that goes from 1930 to 2010. The first thing that you'll see is that we've seen some very substantial decreases in the percentage of runoff that actually is reaching San Francisco Bay. This decrease is happening in all different kinds of water year types, both wet years and dry years and, uh, and, and medium years. And in fact, in recent years, they've been pretty close to record lows. In 2010, only 39% of unimpaired runoff, or expected, estimated unimpaired delta outflow actually flowed into San Francisco Bay. That's not a record low, but it's really close. This indicator is looking at peak flows, the number of days that flows into the bay exceeded 50,000 cubic feet per second. We selected that on the basis of that's the kind of flows which would upstream of the bay be activating the floodplains, and those are the kinds of flows which really stimulate a lot of mixing. Um, and they also shift low salinity habitat in the bay further downstream and away from the delta. Once again, you see that we've seen, a, uh, um, granted with a lot of variability, but a steady decline. And in 2010, in fact, the numbers of days that had high flows was 90% lower than would have been predicted based on unimpaired conditions. Once again, a very substantial decrease in this particular flow attribute. The final one I want to uh, show you is, it's a little bit more of a complicated graph. The top graph here is showing you the, all of the water years from 1930 to 2010 um, as a histogram, and it's showing you the amount of annual flow. The top one is looking uh, at unimpaired flows, and each of the bars in the histogram are color-cated to characterize the different kinds of year types. Blue is for wet years, red is for critically dry years. These water year types are based on the frequency of occurrence. They're not based on the water year indexes that DWR uses. Um, these are just based on the, on the frequency of occurrence, so critically dry years represent the driest 20% of the years in our current hydrological record. And what I'd like you to look at on the top graph, which is unimpaired, is essentially the distribution of the colors. And then we're going to compare that with the bottom graph to uh, the bottom graph, which is actually showing actual conditions. This is essentially using those water year type categories and using the amount of flows in each one of those based on the unimpaired, and then characterizing that year according to the color. So red on the bottom graph means the bay received, under actual conditions, the amounts of water that it would have received under unimpaired conditions in a critically dry year or in the driest 20% of the years. I want to note, too, that actually on both the top graph and the bottom graph, I also went and recolored as black the bars for the driest 5% of years. That's the two years in the top unimpaired. That's actually 1931 and 1977, the two driest years we've had. And in fact, we use the same black color on the bottom unimpaired graph. And as you can see, that not only in many years are we reducing the amounts of flow to the bay to points where they're below the lowest, driest 5% of years under unimpaired conditions, uh, we're not only creating a lot more red bars, 
on the graph uh, on the bottom under actual conditions. We're actually also having a lot of years where the amount of flow reaching San Francisco Bay is the same or lower than it would have been in the driest 5% uh, of conditions before dams and diversions. I want to take a look. Oh, the, for the last 50 years, uh, for example, fully 50% of the years, the bay has been re receiving the amount of water, amount of fresh water that it would have received under critically dry years, which, if you recall, is based on a 20% frequency. So we've increased the frequency of dry years, critically dry years, and we've particularly done it in the last 10 years. So now I'm going to zoom in on this particular part of the graph and just look at the last 10 years, in particular the last decade, which is 2001 to 2010. Under unimpaired conditions, three of those years were critically dry. So it was a bit of a dryish period. But in fact, based on the actual amounts of fresh water that flowed into San Francisco Bay, 80%. Eight out of 10 years. As far as the bay could tell, it was critically dry. We refer to this as essentially subjecting this estuary to chronic drought, condi chronic drought conditions. We developed the index by mathematically combining the results of the six indicators together. And this is the San Francisco Bay Freshwater Flow Index. What you see with the index is you have this, this decline during the first 30 to 40 years of the record that corresponds to the building of dams and many of the large water diversions. And since about the 1970s to 1980s, Conditions have been pretty consistently poor based on the results of these six freshwater flow indexes. We also see that during this past 50 some odd years, about the only time you actually get fair or good conditions is um, in some really wet years. And you'll also see that the last, uh, the most recent year for which we've calculated this index, 2010, that actually happens to be the lowest freshwater inflow uh, index on record. Let me talk a little bit about um, how we evaluated all of these indicators. Um, there are some regulatory standards for flow in certain times of the year, but in fact, we base the benchmarks for each one of these single indicators on the recent State Water Resources Control Board uh, report where they were asked to identify what flows are necessary in the delta and out of the delta to support public trust resources. And at least for the spring period, the state board suggested that 75% uh, of unimpaired flow was necessary to protect public trust resources. And I should have mentioned this in the beginning, but the benchmarks for every single one of the indicators is, are based on that 75% um, recommendation or criterion of the board. Conditions that were greater than that are considered good, and conditions that were worse than that were considered poor. Now let me switch over to um, the responses of at least one of the communities of living resources that use the bay and, in fact, are really very directly affected by the amounts of freshwater flow, and that's the San Francisco Bay Estuaries fish community. For these indicators, we used another wonderful data set uh, developed by and, and produced by the Department of Fish and Game. They have, since 1980, been conducting a comprehensive survey for fish all over the bay. Uh, called the Bay Study. Uh, they use two different kinds of nets, one of which samples sort of the middle of the water column and the other of which samples closer to the bottom. Um, it's a wonderful data set, and they've been very gracious to provide us not only with the data, but also to uh, help us in our understanding of, of, uh, of the information there. We also recognize right off the bat when developing the fish indicators and the fish index that the bay is ecologically a complex place, and in fact, the fish communities differ in different regions of the bay. So for the fish index, which is comprised of 10 individual indicators, we actually calculated the index for each of these four subregions within the bay. The 10 indicators were sort of, part, sort of, sort of uh, categorized into four broad topics. We measured indicators of abundance, indicators of species diversity, how many species we had, um, how, what, what was the species composition of the fish community, particularly in terms of what percentage were native, um, and also the distribution of native fishes within these different regions. Once again, I'm not going to show you all the indicators. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. In both cases of the freshwater index, uh, the freshwater inflow index and the fish index, detailed descriptions of both of the methods and the results are available in the long technical appendix. Uh, for the State of the Bay report. So I'm going to show you a couple. This is the abundance of northern anchovy. Northern anchovy is by far the most common fish species in San Francisco Bay. Its abundance in terms of numbers of fish that you collect per trawl just dwarfs 
all of the other species. So we looked at it separately, because if you lump it into all the other species, um, the results for a northern anchovy essentially drive uh, the pattern that you will see. In each of these graphs, you're going to see the different regions of the bay stacked in exactly this way, Sassoon on top, then San Pablo Bay, then Central Bay, and South Bay, sort of a geographic progression, if you will. And each of them are plotting, in this case, the abundance of northern anchovy against time going from 1980 to 2008, which is as far as we took this particular one up. The first thing you'll see is actually there's really different patterns um, for each of the different subregions. In particular, in Sassoon Bay, Sassoon Bay used to support medium numbers of northern anchovy, at least in some years. But in fact, northern anchovy have pretty much collapsed or disappeared from Sassoon Bay. Their numbers fell during the mid-1980s, and essentially the species is no longer present in any great numbers in Sassoon Bay. In contrast, we're seeing a bit more of a steady decline in the abundance of uh, northern anchovy in San Pablo Bay, the next embayment down. But the further down in the bay you go, down to Central Bay and South Bay, the numbers fluctuate a bit, but in fact, there's no general trend over time. This indicator is taking a look at the composition of the fish community, and it's asking what percentage of the species that are found in each of these regions are native species, either native to the bay or native to local coastal areas. And it's plotting that over time for the, all the years 1980 to 2008. In this case, the benchmark that we're using, unlike the recent historical one we used for abundance, where we just looked at the first 10 years of the survey, we've actually identified um, a percent native species of 85%. Um, and that's based, to some extent, on a fairly extensive literature that says that the prevalence of non-native species is an indication of ecological degradation. And in fact, it has impacts on the communities. We think 85% is pretty, cons uh, pretty conservative. But this is a real good example of a benchmark that's based on professional judgment and not any kind of regulatory or publicly accepted goal out there. In each case, the benchmark is the horizontal line. You can see that Sassoon Bay starts off in poorer condition than uh, the other regions of the bay where, in fact, a fairly large proportion of the species present there are non-native species, um, about 30 30%. And in fact, the, uh, the percentage of native species as a percentage of the community is declining over time. We're also seeing a decline in San Pablo Bay uh, of the percentage of native species. In other words, non-native species are becoming a little bit more prevalent and a little larger uh, fraction of the community. In Central Bay, in contrast, it's very stable, and in fact, most of the species are native. There is actually a very slight decline going on in South Bay as well. So the fish index, in a, in a, in a way very similar to the, uh, the flow index, mathematically combines the results of the component indicators and uh, presents them in these graphs, again, for the four different regions of, this, of, the, uh, of the bay. In each of these graphs, it's plotting the calculated index as the little, little black circles. And the red lines, when you see them occurring, are the linear regression for those regions of the bay where there is a statistically significant linear regression who has a slope different than zero. You can see that in Sassoon Bay, we're getting really, and we have seen, a very large decline in the overall health of the fish community that uses that region of the bay. It has essentially declined from fair-ish conditions to what are pretty poor conditions right now. And that's reflected in large part by decreases in abundance. The overall abundance of fish in, San Fran excuse me, in Sassoon Bay has declined basically 80 to 90 percent uh, during the 30, nearly 30-year 30 record. Uh, that we've got here. That's a very substantial decline in the amount of fish being supported in a large geographic region of San Francisco Bay. We're seeing actually rather significant declines, and as in statistically significant declines in San Pablo Bay. And that also is somewhat of a worrisome trend. And in fact, it's also declining in South Bay. One of the things that the fish index tells us is that the health of San Francisco Bay, as measured in this case, by the health of its fish community varies geographically within the estuary. We tend to see the best health down at the lower reaches of the estuary near the Golden Gate. And in fact, there are a number of e these indicators, including for other species, which pretty clearly indicate that the condition of the living resources in the lower portion of the bay near Golden Gate are being driven actually by ocean conditions more than they're being driven by environmental conditions in San Francisco Bay. In contrast, the conditions of, of many of the living resources, in particular the fish, are poorest the further upstream you go. 
And that should be telling us something about the management of our bay. And in fact, given that this is the region of the bay that is most strongly influenced by inflowing fresh water from its watershed, um, we have a lot of science that actually supports that particular relationship between the quality and quantity of fresh water into the estuary and the biological responses. So let me just close by hopefully giving Andy a nice segue into the last bits of his talk. We can build our State of the Bay report based on the wonderful data that we have available and, in fact, a fairly comprehensive understanding of how this ecosystem works. One of the things the State of the Bay report has done, uh, following again on some earlier work, is that we've, we've essentially evaluated what the results mean relative to what we think we should have in order to have a healthy estuary. We do that because the Bay is a managed system, and we want to understand what we need to do in order to better manage this system, and, in fact, it's also a tool for everybody, scientists, managers, and the public, to hold all of us accountable for how we're managing this tremendously important resource in our backyard. Thank you very much.